My name is Alan Tate. This is my cohort, Dennis Talbot. My other cohort, Bill Algy. We are with the Ages of Rock podcast. You can find us on agesofrock. There, Peter Brady showed up. Agesofrock.com. And today we're going to host a Q&A with uh, Mark Goodman. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> All righty. I remember I saw, I come from the country, so we didn't have cable television. And in 1980. Three, I moved to Evansville to go to college, and I remember first thing I did, I walked into our apartment that I was staying at, and MTV was on, and I'm like, wow, they're playing another video, and another video, and it's like, I stayed up all night. So Mark, you and all the other VJs were a welcome guest in my home for two years. My TV basically just stayed on MTV. <laughs> so how, how much did you watch, would you say, back then? Oh my gosh, anytime I was home, it was, it was on. And, you know, it was, I would watch this, watch that. Well, it turned out okay, man. Yeah, we, didn't, we didn't ruin you. Did it didn't we? rot my brain or anything. Yeah. But no, it's, it, it, was, it was one of those things where it was just cozy to have it and to see the music, you know, love listening to it, but it was my stereo. And you had the visual, too, on top of that. But it was, yeah. it was great. So, Bill? Yeah. So, Mark, um, at the time MV, M MTV started, you were a really very popular number one DJ in the New York area. Yeah. So... Yeah. What, what made you make the leap? It was, people thought I was crazy. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in radio, I was at the number one rock station in the number one market in the country. And, uh, you know, that's where you're trying to get if you're in radio. Um, but I was kind of bored because we didn't play punk at that station at all. And I liked a lot of punk stuff. And, and we played sort of the same stuff. So I was just looking for something where I could be involved in the growth of rock and roll, you know, the furthering of music. And, you know, rock radio in 1980 was, you know, a lot of form. I started in radio and it was free form. So I was looking for that kind of spirit anyway. And it wasn't really there at that radio station, a great station. We played great music, but not enough of it. And stroke of luck, a friend of mine in radio in Philadelphia, where I'm from, where I started, um, called me and told me about this friend of mine who was working at this company, Warner Amex, and they were doing some sort of video music channel. And I made the call, and it wasn't that difficult for me to decide to do it, because I thought, well, it seems like a good idea. Seems like it'll work. I knew what videos were. I was a music director in Philadelphia, so I, people had come to me with videos. Seemed like a good idea. I don't know, I figured, okay, so I'm, at least I'll have a job for probably another five or 10 years at least. <laughs> I took the shot. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so when did you know that you had taken off? That it was the, the the station was going and it was get out of the way. Here we come. There was there was a couple of things that that happened to the company early on. I mean, we were. They told everybody, including the five VJs, when we launched that we had over two million people who were watching on cable. This is the beginning of cable, really, so MTV wound up ultimately selling cable, but so they lied, <laughs> basically. <laughs> we launched with like 400,000 people, maybe something like that, 600,000. But within six months, the first thing that we heard was out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was one of the earliest markets that had MTV, and there were people going into record shops in Tulsa and asking for this album called The Age of Plastic by The Buggles. Hadn't been on the shelves for a year and a half, two years. None of the shop owners could understand what the hell was going on. Why were people asking for this record? It was because MTV launched in the market and brought that, that album and that band back. That was the first thing that I noticed. And then part of what we had to do in the beginning was the five of us would be sent out to various markets around the country to like go out to dinner with the cable operators and hey, why don't you pick up MTV? It'd you know, really be cool if you would add that to your, cha you know, your channel lineup. And so we would do that. And I was making an appearance at a record shop in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And we literally, I was in the car being driven over there and came around the corner and there was like a thousand people standing out in the street. And I asked the, the driver, what's going on up there? What's, who's here? And he goes, you are <laughs> like what so i thought that was 
that was my first really experience of like, holy crap, people really like this. It's pretty amazing. That is cool. How old were you when that when that happened? We we launched, uh, and I was, I want to say like 29 or something like that, 30. I haven't really done the math. I was in uh, high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. We want to leave you. We'll let you guys ask some questions. So if you guys want to step up to the mic, uh, please do so, and um, we'd like to have you guys be able to ask some questions. Tell us your name and where you're from. I'm Ryan from Nashville, Tennessee. Hey! <laughs> I love this town. What's the most outrageous moment that you had? Uh, outrage comes in a lot of forms. <laughs> um, uh, outrageous. Well, I, uh, I got to uh, be the, the live reporter for MTV from the Us 83 Festival. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, amazing. Which was amazing. We watched it. We, oh, you just watched it? Yeah. Oh. It was insane. And if you just watched it, then you know yeah. Metal Day, yes. Ozzy, you know, and it was an insane day. There was, that was the highest attendance day. There was about 400,000 people there. And, uh, and it was San Bernardino, California, which is Freaking hot! <laughs> it's gross there, and they're literally like hosing people down in the front and, and stuff. And for, this was the first time that MTV was covering something that was live, live, and like like real TV. We were trying to do a live shot with me from the stage. So what was supposed to happen was I was supposed to come up on stage, greet everybody and welcome them and so on, and then bring Ozzy out. So, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have ever had to host a concert, but yeah. you know, you get up on stage and you do, hey, what's everybody doing? Let's rock and roll today, let's have some fun. Woo! Get everybody screaming and yelling. All right, everybody, if you're ready, okay, this is Ozzy Osbourne. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it was too early? We, gotta, we have to do that again? <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm like to the crowd of 400,000 people, okay, you guys are awesome. Take two. <laughs> it's just not the same the second time. So that was a pretty outrageous moment. <laughs> we got a great question. Okay. Bring it on. What's your name? Shane Paisley. Where are you from? Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Did video really kill the radio star? I'm fucking here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> here I am. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I don't know how, how, what a great choice that was for a first song. Radio was a little upset about that. I bet it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Sean Coleman. I, uh, I know you, Sean. Yeah, we met early. Uh, we're currently in central Arkansas, but I'm from Florida. Huh? Uh, I thought I'd share a little something, but then I... I've come up with two questions now. Go for it. Um, I grew up in the 70s. My family listened to the radio all the time. So I was always up on what was cool on radio, but I was a kid, so I didn't know who the hell sang anything. Uh, and then in 1983, same as you, I discovered MTV, and I was completely mesmerized, and I sat there. I drove my dad freaking crazy because I was visiting my dad that summer, and I had MTV on bare minimum six hours a day yeah. by the end of the summer they're like god damn it will you turn that shit off you know um and then every summer i've come to visit them it would go right back on they're like god damn here we go again but anyway mtv actually taught me about music because like i said i didn't know who sang anything and mtv showed you who the artist was what they looked like what the name of the album was and when i got back home to florida that at the end of that summer I was like the aficionado on everything that was going on, on the radio. Oh, that zebra, that's off, that's off this album, you know? You're like a music database. I know, and, and you ask her, and it's only grown since then. So, I mean, I'm a freaking encyclopedia on music. But anyway, MTV is what did that for me. Um, so, two questions. First question, um, I've learned in the last 10 or so years that Mike Nesmith was the creator, essentially, of... MTV. He, he attempted to do it first, yeah. Yeah, and he's, from what I understand, he sold the idea, and that's what became MTV. Did you ever meet him? 
I never met Mike. I met the others. Okay. Um, there was that that reunion, that Monkeys yeah. reunion. I went to that concert. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I met them around uh, around then. He, I mean, he wasn't that he sold the idea. He just had the idea. Gotcha. And he tried it. If you saw the uh, I Want My MTV documentary, they had some footage. I, I thought that was they did a great job on that, and there was some footage of what his his show was like, and it was okay. Right. But you know, we just sort of took it a few steps further than that, and that was right. I, I forget now, like five years before we launched. Okay. Um, but he's you know he gets he doesn't get enough of the credit. He really was. The nut job behind the idea, you know, right. it was cool. So, uh, question number two: um, I noticed over the years watching MTV that a lot of the VJs would have the same thing to say about the music video after it, and sometimes what was being said was kind of cheesy. So, I was wondering if you guys, <laughs> if MTV ever came to you guys behind the scenes and were like, "Yeah, uh, this video is popular." Why don't you make these particular comments about that? Uh, the only one I remember in particular was Bruce Springsteen's On Fire. Um, I don't remember what the spiel was specifically, but er, like three or four VJs were like, you remember that time when you were young and you fell in love and it was just like, oh yeah, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, somebody's forcing these guys to say this. <laughs> um, as long as I was there, we were never, ever told what to say. Okay. Um, except one exception. I do remember that the word came down from on high, you know, from our management. From this day forward, you will refer to Michael Jackson as the king of pop. <laughs> <laughs> he decided that. He told his label. They told us. And we had to frickin' do it. So that was about as close as we got because we, I mean, we did news and stuff, but that was, we had a news department, we'd gather it, we would deliver it in our, our own way. And certainly when it came to your opinion about a video or about an artist or whatever, they never told us what to say. Cool. Now, what did happen was the studio was a separate world. The people at the office, the suits, we didn't know them. I mean, we didn't go up there, they didn't come down. It was two different worlds. So we'd be down there recording shows, recording, recording. Re and every week, of course, they add new music. But it would just, we'd get logs and it would just show up. Oh, wow, here's the new Pat Benefit. I haven't seen this bucket video. <laughs> what is so I, I put together a card file that listed each artist and their video, the names of the videos, and a little spiel about each of them. So, maybe they were reading my cards too much. <laughs> I got a quick question too. When you guys filmed your, your slots, how did, that, how did that work through like Monday through Friday? Did you do all your spots for a day? You know, each we, day uh, or how did that work? Nobody ever asked me that before. It's, it, what happened when we first launched, yeah, we shoot five days, but we're on the air seven. Sure. <laughs> so. We, and we were literally, like, we would get there at 7 in the morning, start shooting at 8, and not wrap until, like, midnight. Wow. And it would just, it, uh, we, most Monday, when, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 24 hours of MTV. Thursday and Friday ultimately became, um, well, extra days to do Saturday and Sunday. But the way that we pulled it off was um, we developed what we called lean hours. So uh, from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Eastern, there was less breaks per hour. So we could get through those more quickly. And we were able to record on Thursday and Friday, 48 hours of gotcha. MTV. But it was still, like we, we got crazy in the studio, you know, at 11.30 at night after having been there all day long. <laughs> like the cameraman or drinking and like, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was a mess but one of them uh, came up with this thing because they were just the cameraman and the crew were just trying to keep us like up you know and awake and ready right. to have, you know, have fun and so they would do shit like they came up with runaway camera <laughs> <laughs> like all of a sudden we'd be doing a break and talking to the news and hi runaway camera <laughs> 
camera. And like this <laughs> camera would come rolling across the set, you know, smashing into things. You do? Yeah. There's very few people. We did it a bunch, but there's very few people who have mentioned it to me. That's cool. I'm glad. Like you said it. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just to keep us conscious. <laughs> now, with regard to Michael Jackson's Thriller video, yeah. I remember it being every hour on the hour. Pretty much. It was just <laughs> so ridiculously popular, yeah. and the whole family would say, "What the the." Clock is chiming. It's it's thriller time, and it was it was so ridiculously popular, to that point where it was timed. And I think that was the only timed video ever. How was that calculated? Was that through Michael Jackson's people, or was it an MTV thing? Was it natural? It's part of the playing? part of the the deal that we had made when we got the video, uh, that particular video, the thriller video, was we made a big deal out of it. If you remember, we world premiered it, and yes. We did play it every fucking hour. <laughs> yes. And it's so much so, in fact, this is true. I, one morning during that time, I was late to get to the studio. I had to take a cab from my house down to the studio. And I was really late for this shoot, and I was freaking out. And I jump in the cab, and, and I'm like, okay, 33rd and 10th, you got to get me down there really fast. I'm late. And the cab driver turns around, and he looks at me, he goes, Hey, Ma, don't worry. If you're late, They'll just show Thriller three more times. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's that. Yeah. I got another question. Sure. There, video really did kill the radio star in the fact that arguably you had to be good looking to be on MTV. I disagree. And, 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 and well, I understand there were certain artists, they, they didn't get the whole thing of, well, why would I make a video? What's the point? I'm already on radio. Did you hear some kickback of a frustration of artists saying they don't want to play this video game, they like the older format? There were uh, a bunch of the bands that really had a, a big problem with it. Kevin Cronin, REO Speedwagon, he hated doing them. He really didn't like MTV. He didn't, they were a bar band. Yeah. You know, they were like, let's get up there and let's play and let's have a good time. REO? Yeah. They're great. Amazing. They're amazing. And Kevin, I, I've since become great friends with Kevin. He's awesome. He was part of our, uh, we did this anniversary thing for our 40th on the 80s, and Kevin came on and did some stuff with us. But um, it, just, <laughs> it just wound up being that we, some segued into it, um, and even like Scorpions, not a particularly great looking band. They were fine. <laughs> they did great. Some of their videos probably would not clear today. <laughs> Thinking about right now. Well, I heard that Deranged Women was sought out because they were good looking. Well, they weren't sought out. I mean, they were, they were what they were. Duran Duran, one of our early success stories, obviously. But they, um, the, the first album had been out. And it was, you know, in America not really that well received. Radio was not that interested in adding any music from them. And, but so for them, video, and they really, it wasn't just that they were a good looking band, they, they did these really cool videos, you know, they, in Sri Lanka for Save a Prayer or Rio. I mean, how legendary is that, right? So they had that, that was their thing. And the what? Girls on film. Yeah. Girls, no, we put it on in the edited form. <laughs> Rest assured that Alan Hunter and I made sure. <laughs> Never mind. I was about to ask if you previewed every video, but I guess we know the answer to at least that question. From well, for years, for no, <laughs> we didn't. For years, no, we, it, they would literally show up in the log. And for the first year, we weren't on in Manhattan. So we couldn't even go home and watch MTV. They literally used to make tapes for us that we could watch at home just right. to see what was going on. Hey, Mark. Hey. Uh, Andy Parker from Nashville. Hey. Uh, two things. Uh, were you aware in the time when you guys were living that moment that you were opening up doors and influencing um, bands that we may have never heard? Like me, for example, two bands that I, well, one I got into, his name was Charlie Sexton. I would have never heard him had I not seen right. the New Year's Eve performances that he did. 
And then uh, there was a band called uh, Steel Breeze that had hit You Don't Want yeah. Me Anymore. You don't want me anymore. <laughs> I love that song. My friends think I'm an idiot, but I'm like, it's a great pop song and it's gone. But I would have never heard it had I not seen a video on right. MTV. Were you aware at that time that you're opening the world to a lot of people? That was why like, I wanted to go MTV? there. That was why I, wanted, I left the job in radio <clears throat> to go to MTV because I thought that's what would happen. Yeah. That we were going to be playing new music, we were going to be playing new bands, and we were going to be turning people on to new stuff. It was great. That's why then I went. The other thing, real quick, because I'm a big KISS fan, was there an argument over who got to do the unmasking? <laughs> or did it just have to be JJ's time? Because um, we were glued to our TVs for that. Right, right I remember that. Um, there, no, I don't think there was an argument. JJ just kind of got the assignment and it went about it and, it and did it. No. Not so much. He just got it. He lucked out. And speaking of faces not made to fit the trend. Yeah. <laughs> he should have kept it back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he's no referring to Kiss's, yeah. Kiss's face is not made for MTV. <laughs> That's what They're made for radio. <laughs> Gene Simmons looks pretty much the same either way. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Julie in uh, Central Arkansas. Your thoughts about, and I thought it was fine, but the Billy Squire... Uh, yeah. Video, what, didn't he? Get, wasn't that just ridiculous, or what do you think? That was video kill. That was video kill the star. Exactly. <laughs> I, he absolutely believes that. Billy Squire believes that that video killed his career. <laughs> I, I sort of lean in that direction. It was pretty <laughs> awful. And he's, I, I, Billy. I knew Billy long before MTV. I knew him in Piper, and when I was in. In radio, I had interviewed him and had you know people come around with him to my radio station. And he, this guy, he's really smart. He's a really cool guy. He really, he never let, uh, he never took his hands off what he was doing. This was one time Kenny Ortega directed that video, who was a choreographer, and he, Billy, just let him do it. Billy never did that before, and. Kenny, you know, just went and did what he did. Uh, yeah, I think it, I think it, killed, it really didn't help. But having said that, um, he, the music that he was coming out with, he had like three records in a row that were platinum. But then things started to, to taper off. They just were. So, you know, what influenced what? I don't, I don't know. That, that song was a number one song. It's not like people didn't like the song. That song literally went to number one on the pop chart. He's, Smash. He's also the number one sample artist. Well, the big beat song. Yeah, the, absolutely. Well, that, huge. He's not huge hurt. in hip hop. He's not hurt. <laughs> oh, no. He, you know, I had him on like a year ago or a year and a half ago on my show. And he used to live up the street from me on Central Park West. And he, for many years, he, has, he was looking after a section of Central Park that was right in front of his building. He would be out there, like, trimming hedges and watering and fertilizing. He, this is what he does. He doesn't do that anymore. He's been living out on, in the Hamptons now. And he's, he, play, he played out there r relatively recently. He's done a couple of gigs in, uh, in New York with G.E. Smith. On guitar, and um, but that's gardening is what he does now, and he has no desire to come back to the business. He's very happy. Yeah. He's a, because why? Because he's a, because he's a rocker and he's a musician and he's a writer. And well, we saw him about ten years ago, eight years ago in concert, just doing a, like a little festival. It was amazing. And it was great. He's, he's great. Just, it's just good to see him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, especially, uh, look, I mean, I know this is rock and pod and everything, but rock as a genre is not the influential genre that it, it was 30 years ago. True. You know, it's just not. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree. We saw but there's great rock and roll being made out there, and I know that you people know that. All right. So, I want to know how Mark Goodman, Alan Hunter, and Nina Blackwood go from being on MTV to off doing their different things, and now they're on Sirius XM. <laughs> the, the weird thing about us joining Sirius was I 
in uh, 2000, early 2004, like January, I had heard about it, you know, and heard XM was up first. XM's rocket went up first. Uh, Sirius was a year later. And like, I w was living in LA, and I was working at, at K Rock in LA, a legendary radio station. And all these people that I was working with over there were all on Sirius. I was like, what the fuck? How come I'm not on there? <laughs> so I had an idea for, for a show that I had been doing and, and um, brought that in. And they were like, yeah, no, we don't want that. But um, we will take you. <laughs> so they hired me. I was the first one hired and, um, for the Big 80s. And I put the guy who was running the Big 80s at the time in touch with Alan and, and Nina and Martha. Martha did not come for the first couple of years. She, she just didn't feel like it. But um, Nina and Alan did. JJ was waiting for me to kind of give him feedback on it. He, he and I were the radio people uh, among the VJs. And he, want, he, he just didn't understand what this was going to be and why he wasn't sure about the company. So I started in uh, February of 2004. And JJ died in March. So um, he, I told him about it, but he never got a chance to do it. And I just told the others, like, this is cool. Let's come on, you know? And, and it was at, at the time where the, the company was founded on DJs doing stuff in their house, you know, like we've all been doing for the last year and a half. That's what the company was founded on. So I was living in LA, and I was doing my shows on the big 80s from my bedroom, you know? That's the way that, um, and 90% of the DJs on Sirius, even now, are still, you know, at home somewhere. So we're getting, we're getting down here on time. Okay. I have one quick question I'd like to know. So it, you were on the air in New York City when John Lennon got shot. How was that, how did you deal with that? How was, I mean, being that you're live on there and you're having to tell people this, I mean, that's a shocking thing, especially being in the city itself. Not only was I in the city and on the air, I lived next door, wow. literally. It was one west, that was the Dakota. Sure. Right. My building was 15 west. I could look from my apartment, I could kind of look down into some of his rooms wow. in the Dakota. I never saw him in the neighborhood, but um, so there's two times that I've cried on the air and that's one of them. Wow. I, I just I didn't know what to make of it. What? John Lennon murdered, and it was I incomprehensible. And the way that it happened at first was the listeners were calling me. Hey, did you hear something about John Lennon? Because Howard Cosell said it on Monday Night Football. Right. right. Yep. And that was where most of America first heard about it. And so I was working at, at an ABC affiliate in New York, and I went around to the AM side and the news department and asked what was on. And they said, yeah, we just got a report that he was shot. We didn't even know he was dead. And I was right in the middle of paying tribute to Jim Morrison, whose birthday it was. And the song, when I got the official call from the news department that he was dead, I was in the middle of the end. Wow. Wow. I, wow. It was, yeah, I'll never forget that. But, so, and we just started playing Beatles music nonstop. Right. And then I got off the air at 2 a.m. and I had to go home to that, you know, everybody was out front and I had to show my ID to get on the street and they were still listening to my station, so. Well, that's, that's fantastic, we'll wrap it up then. So we're on time here. Yeah, okay. all right, Mark, we're gonna keep everybody on time, so Fair thank enough. you, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you. your time today. Thank you guys, yeah. and the great hey, story. thanks, really fun. Right. And we are Ages of Rock, and you can find us on agesofrock.com and you can find us on all of the social media outlets and all the podcast platforms. Thank you guys for hanging out. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Ages of rock. I'm going to come away with some, some new shit. <laughs>